Uh, it's the the in the garage equivalent to getting the hose stuck when you're washing the car on one of the wheels, <laughs> and, and you're just kind of <laughs> that's when you throw the th- throw the hose at the car and break a window, and then have the mm-hmm. water go. I've never done. Have you done this? No, but I do routinely just yell "fuck" at uh, while washing my car uh, because of that. Anyway, I uh, routinely yell that at my neighbors who, who give me dirty looks because you know, of course, I'm emptying the reservoirs that are overflowing because it won't stop fucking raining. Um, you know, I wash each of the well, I, I wash, I clean the old cars, but I wash each, like my new cars that each the van and the golf each probably once, twice a year, and every time I get the dirtiest looks, oh. and I just want to take the hose. Really? And <laughs> yeah. Why do you, why do they care? Because they, people want you to go to like a car wash where it's recycled water and the, you know, oh, really? a, a Brillo I, brush can scratch the shit out of your paint. Or, I've definitely had people who, um, publicly shame me for washing my car. Yeah. Uh, and it's always an interesting conversation. At some point we should have the discussion about the 308. I, have I told that story about this woman who gave me a hard time while I was, had the 308 on the sidewalk? At some yes, point. Yes, vaguely. But you should just hit her in the face with the water, which is probably, you know, a, a I mean, assault. you know, you ask incisive questions like, what is your carbon footprint like? Do you travel places? Do you fly? Do you consume tissue? Do you X, Y, Z, you know? And then you get, <laughs> like, I, I, you just go into this sort of like, I'm very combative. If uh, someone does that to me, I'm oh yeah, extremely of combative. Yeah, my thing is, would you like me to be able to see out of my windows or would you like me to run over your fucking dog? Keep walking. Huh. You know, that's, that's, that's sort the of New thing. York approach. Because, well, I bet the, the only reason I'm watching my outside, sitting outside and being destroyed by all elements, beater, is because I can't see out of the fucking thing. Mm, of um, course. Well, this has been a long and meandering episode. I mean, introduction of this episode of the Carmudgeon Show. Uh, which is brought to you by the Haggerty Podcast Network, which... Hi, Haggerty Drivers Club. Isn't that what you meant to say? No, which is brought to you by the Haggerty Podcast Network. And if you'd like to help support this, consider joining the Haggerty Drivers Club, which gives you unlimited flatbed toast to all, for all, on all, which under... F- over position, all <laughs> proposition, all of your classic cars, plus access to our valuation tools and our award-winning magazine. Check it out with the link below. Great. And, and away now, we go. Uh, you know what you didn't do last week? People, oh, people God. noticed. Look at that. Um, oh, hold on. Jake has just thrown something at me saying, uh, don't forget you can also watch our content on Samsung TV Plus channel 1194. Um, we'll talk about that later. I don't know. Is that, that's a Samsung. It's even functioned this entire episode. Boop. I need to just go to med school. (laughs) Add that to your task of things to do. Yeah. Uh, Including this episode. (laughs) Right. Because we're Um, just wasting time at this point. Are you done being jet lagged? Um, yeah, I've been so exhausted that I just sleep whenever I'm in bed and I guess I did wake up early and waking up a little bit early, which is fine. I have lots to do. I'm not, I'm just sleeping. (laughs) I mean, to skip a whole night of sleep, like I was in my twenties, I couldn't skip a night. Mm -hmm. Like I could, if I got less than six hours, I just really couldn't function. And so that first night that we were in Florida, I got less than three and I just didn't work. Like I'm just... And then we record. We were up at six o'clock in the morning, uh, our time recording. No, no, no. Mo- we were already recording at six a.m. Yes, that's time. right. We were up at four, four. in the morning. Yeah. Um, so apologies for that episode, <laughs> not not least for the um, colorful commentary in response to the discussion of the future of automobiles as imagined by Stellantis. We'll get there in a second. Yes, um, but no apologies for the oh, look. You know, we work for, I work for, technically you don't, you're, you're an no. independent curmudgeon. Um, yes. I work for- Strong a com- independent curmudgeon. <laughs> 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 I work for a company that has a lot of competing interests and a lot of people want, not competing interests, I should say, a lot of different interests. Diverse. Diverse yes. interests. And there are a lot of people involved. And on this one, um, I went to Amelia initially so that I could support Radwood because I obviously, there are very few things that, I shouldn't say there are very few things. One of the things that I most enjoy doing in my own time is interacting with 80s and 90s cars. And so Radwood is like my show. That's where I fit in the most and I enjoy myself the most. And so, of course, I'll go to Amelia. It's amazing. But, 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 but I will go to any Radwood like on my own dime. And so when they, when Art Cervantes from Radwood reached out and was like, hey, would you come to Amelia and give out an award? My answer is like, yeah, 100%. And then that turned into, well, why you, while you guys are there, do you guys want to do a podcast? Well, duh. You Live love, at Radwood. Right, yeah, like we did uh, here. It was fun. It past. was great. Um, and so we're like, yeah, okay, then we're in. Well, 
Once everyone else got wind that we were going to be there doing a podcast, it turned into, oh, well, why don't you guys do the podcast across the street from Redwood before Redwood starts? And then why don't you do it, in fact, the morning before anything starts? And then it becomes like, why don't we interview a, a Chrysler CEO who... Who? I mean, look, Ralph Shields, we know, but like Chris, I've never spoken to her before. I didn't, we didn't know what the fuck was going on. Um, so we met her on air, as you literally on air, right? And I didn't know her last name. I just knew her name was Chris. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we were kind of surprised. Like I saw a bunch of the comments. Were like, how much did did um, Haggerty get paid for this by Chrysler? shut up like nobody got paid anything except for the pr guy who works for us now on contract who used to work for Stellantis, and i think his allegiances are perhaps a little bit in the wrong spot if he thought it was a good idea to put the ceo of chrysler this chrysler brand on a podcast where she's like the biggest luxury in the world is not having to ever drive one of these goddamn cars um <laughs> maybe that's true about chrysler products <laughs> I love my Dodge Grand Caravan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Your vagina. You didn't tell her about your vagina on air. <laughs> where everyone is very disappointed that you didn't do that. <laughs> Please tell me there are no comments about that. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I, didn't, okay, I didn't read them. Uh, just, let me, let me, let's just make this very clear. I didn't really want to hear or learn anything about Chris's vagina. And I, I fully expect that that sentiment was mutual. Uh, mutual. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but instead we learned about Chris's, um, Halcyon, which may not even be hers, but yes, uh, there was a bunch of interesting lessons on that, uh, on that car, including that women drive like this from Ralph, which I thought was an interesting observation. Yeah. He said, he said some stuff where I was like, wow, can we still say that now? No, and Ralph's a real car guy. I don't know. I listen. I think the fact that Ralph pointed out that the entire design team was women and um, Ralph don't kill us for saying this, but like I think a lot of his commentary was probably a mandate from above within Chrysler that he was going to talk about women. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly seemed that way, and uh, so I hope we're not rocking the boat on any of this. But like I don't. That's kind of what we do. This is why we shouldn't be allowed near new, new OEMs. <laughs> I I. <laughs> I have a firm belief that things that are marketed towards women in the automotive industry automatically fail because women are people and we should just be marketing to people. Yeah, there is a history of that. There's an interesting story of, I think there was a Dodge sub-brand in the 1950s and I, have, I, I haven't brushed up on this, so it's going to be very uh, ad hoc. But they designed a whole like line of, I think, Dodge models that was specifically for women, including the color schemes. And now they're wildly collectible by men, of course. <laughs> um, but they had like sort of specific uh, colorways that mm -hmm. were, you know, p pink and gray and stuff mm -hmm. like that, that they did. And I think it was 1957 or something like that. Uh, generally, obviously, because nobody knows about it, it was a commercial failure. But right. I think that reinforces the point that you just made. There's a there's a, a known um, uh, thing in the industry that if you design a car for women, it fails. If mm -hmm. you design a car for men, specifically, women want it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a yeah, strange like phenomenon. thing about, um, I think it's the forerunner is very popular with women, mm -hmm. which is like this very butch and serious, you know, they want to, I don't know, feel safe or project yeah. a new image of invincibility or, you know, I, I don't Whatever know. I'm it not going to study right. the psychology of it, yeah. but, uh, but it's kind of a known yes. thing, right? You do, you design a car that's soft and, and feminine, um, f and in the idea of appealing to women drivers and they go for G wagon. Yes. Um, and it, it's the, the rule is you don't design a car for women. And I think that's the right thing to do is you design a car for people, mm -hmm. right? You don't necessarily have to differentiate between men and women. You look at what families need, what individuals need, and you look at the person involved rather than their genitalia there, mm -hmm. for example, Vanja. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just, so I think the idea of like trying to, I don't, know, I don't know that the house concept was pretty to me. It looks a lot like uh, a pin and free uh, and Batista up front. Mm -hmm. I think where you can, and sh you know, where, where cars are really successful when they're designed with feminine design features are supercars, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so you see sultry sort of curvaceous, uh, right? I mean, cars. it's, it's yeah. But sex it, sells. Yeah. But it doesn't sell on like, you know, for example, a Mazda, like Mazdas are very feminine, very beautiful. And I happen to love them, but they, they're, they're they go unnoticed by the drive 
by the car well, buying That was public. the goal of the new CX-50, was to butch it up mm -hmm. a little, right? Yeah. They need to, because yeah. Jeeps sell to women, mm -hmm. i.e. to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And it was something like 79% of all automotive decisions are made by, uh, by a female. Um, really? There are crazy stats on this. It's amazing. Huh. Um, yeah, females are far more important uh, to, to... I guess it's probably finding. because it's a domain that is uh, sort of in people's minds dominated by men, and so it is a sign of sort of olive branching to involve... Um, your partner, I think, if she's a female, I think a lot of cars are bought by family. New cars are bought by family mm -hmm. families, and and you know, typically it's the moms who are like, "Hey, let's be rational about what we need," rather than you know, I know you think you can shove your kid in the back of a nine eleven like your father did to you, um, yes. and that's why you're so short. <laughs> you're <laughs> curled up into a ball. Petrol oriented, but, yeah. also. I also I need to find the remote because the heat is blasting. Are you cooking? Are you not? I'm fine, but I'm in a t-shirt and you're in a hoodie. Oh, Jake has been looking around, looking at the looking at the AC like. <laughs> um, okay. Um, but yeah, we were at Amelia definitely not to see a, a new concept. We were there to see a bunch of old shit. Mm -hmm. um, and we did. And we did. All flavors of old. All not wet. All. Yes. Every one moist. of them was wet. Yeah. The show kind of got, so the show basically got rained out. I mean, you there was some significant precipitation i mean to be fair we did sort of roll in at a pacific time zone time to an event that starts at zero dark 30 oh i'm talking about the sunday when it yeah, yeah that's what i mean when it all when it all started pouring um yes. okay so let's talk about amelia let's talk, talk about amelia let's talk about the components actually yeah, first that's yeah, a, good a high idea. level uh it is you know the concord itself is probably the most prestigious concord in america after uh, pebble beach mm -hmm. Uh, it's pretty well established. Heavy duty stuff shows up. It is a prestigious place to win an award, you know, second only to Pebble Beach. So that's the anchoring event, much the way that the Concord Elegance is at Car Week or traditionally has been. And that's Sunday, uh, basically all day Sunday. Uh, it is accompanied by Radwood. It is accompanied the day before in the same location uh, as the main Concord, a more sort of democratic event that's more open to the public with a sort of um broader array that of was cars the cars and caffeine yes which is where we ended up doing our presentation of the Carmudgeon show mm -hmm. uh and then there's a bunch of auctions uh and there's like a all Porsche event that's on Friday and there's a few other sort of ancillary events but so including the, the hangar which we went yes to. the hangar which is, uh, which is great. A, a great event that's put on by the same people people who put on the bridge Jeff Einhorn uh and his crew there uh and so there's an array of events, but there isn't. Uh, there's no motorsports component to it like there is during Car Week. There's, I would say, quite a bit less OEM presence, uh, okay. and quite a bit easier parking. Uh, if you're staying, if you're staying in the center, in the center of the center, event, right. yeah. So overall, it's a much smaller event. It's than, definitely a smaller event, yeah. which is has a lot of benefits in terms of just ingress and egress. And but a bigger event, I would say, than Villa Desta. Yes, because there's one anchoring event for mm -hmm. that, uh, and this is a whole suite of events. So it's mm -hmm. you know, a probably the second largest if you say the whole schedule. Mm -hmm. I'm just sort of shooting yep. from the hip here, but I think it's probably this, the second largest car event. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. then you have to talk about like these week long American car things that I know nothing I about, about yeah. Yeah. but presumably exist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> presumably, um, presumably. Um, uh, You're talking about like Waterfest, and <laughs> I'm kidding. No, like no, that's like Waterfest uh, type things, which is my VW background. That's uh, no, there's like good guys and yeah. like yeah. some kind of Woodward Dream Cruise or yeah. something. I, I don't know. It's not You've never been to Woodward space. probably because same for same reason I haven't because it's always the same week as Pebble Beach. Oh really? Yeah. Huh. Um, which is I wanted to go, but even when I lived in Michigan, I would fly to uh, California to do a, go to Car Week. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, all right. So um, there's big surprises to me. The biggest one of all was Sunday. The, at the actual show, there was a class for 90s JDM, mm -hmm. JDM fun shit. Yeah, 80s and 90s stuff. Yeah, so that was cool. So That's so unbelievable. It's a completely different, not completely different. There are definitely categories, like you said, that simply do not exist at Pebble Beach. I mean, Pebble Beach best of show, first time being won by a post-war car. It was like, holy shit, a car from after World War II that this won was best of show? This was right. in the last 10 years, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and, you know, the, the idea historically also, I remember when a Lamborghini Miura was displayed at Pebble Beach for the first time, which is now Gasp. probably 20 years ago, uh, definitely gasping and mm-hmm. sort of clutching of pearls and, <laughs> and clutching of blue blazers mm-hmm. and straw hats yeah. and whatnot, because a Lamborghini, which a car which did not even exist until 1960 something, mm-hmm. being displayed at Pebble Beach was like heresy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, to see a JDM class was really cool. There was definitely several classes there that you would absolutely not see. And so it was nice to see that there's like a unique identity, which is, I think, more, uh, accessible, appealing, sort of mainstreaming and, and, you know, because when we did this Haggerty, uh, industry professional discussion at Car Week last year, you know, the observation was the average year of a car sold at auction during that week was 1964, which was the same as it was the year before and, you know, ad infinitum into the past. So for there to be this emphasis on newer cars uh, is definitely different from the Concord portion of Car Week. Of course, at Car Week, there are plenty of other events right. oriented towards non antediluvian hardware. Yeah. <laughs> this is this another entry in Derek Dictionary? No, got it. I, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm staying out of this. Um, no, it's actually one of the the event on Sunday is actually my least favorite event at Car Week um, because yes. those cars are the are the cars that I know the least yes. about, um, and frankly, there are too many of them. Um, Pebble Beach has become far too big for me to walk through, um, and you can't break in, uh, you know, suck in 300 cars or it's 200 something cars. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and try to learn anything about them in with crowds and everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where I think Villa Desta does a really much better job at curating. There's just what, 20, 30 cars, something like that. And that that was it. But each one is an 11 out of. Yeah. And, but you can take time to talk to the owner and take time to talk to people around it or learn about the car while you're there. Mm -hmm. And it's just the Pebble Beach has become a parking lot. I mean, it's a parking lot of the most amazing cars around but i just ah it's too much mm-hmm. um and you know the, so i but i understand and i appreciate that there is there is a re there's reasoning behind keeping things the same right and this is a car show this is a concord elegance that you know sort of yeah you always celebrating it's a tradition that yeah has existed for many decades right. probably since the cars were new mm-hmm. the pre-war cars were new uh and it evolved i think from a desire to celebrate individual coach work you know it was much more possible then because cars had separate frames and you could buy a chassis Chassis. with powertrain and all of that but no body and send it to whomever you like Mm -hmm. and it was sort of this you know atelier approach of you know i'm going to go with this coach builder because they built my family's stage coaches a hundred years ago or you know this is an extension of my personality and i want something really flamboyant or i'm a very conservative businessman and i want something that's very upright and formal and right. you know we're not whatever talking about what what percentage of window tint you're getting right yes. we're talking, yes. massive we're talking changes. about you know the difference between a I don't know, let's say Castagna body on an Isola Fraschini versus a Figoni Falashi body on a Delahaye. Admittedly, those are 10 years apart. Mm-hmm. But you you get all the way from like really formal, upright town car sedan things to just these incredibly flashy, you know, the, the Lamborghinis of their days. Instead, you would do that with coachwork. Except they weren't mass produced. They were one-off. Correct. Every they were, one they of were was largely one-off cars. And so you would do that instead of buying a Lamborghini, you would just choose a body. So, you know, that was, so if you were like, I'm a Mercedes guy, I really like the way Mercedes engineers are cars, or I'm a, du- uh, a, a Duesenberg guy or whatever, you could choose the mechanics and then match it with a body that sort of expressed mm-hmm. you. And then you didn't have to be like, well, I really like the way that, you know, Lamborghini makes engines, but I hate the way they look. You could sort of piece mm-hmm. together a solution. Anyway, Concord Elegance emerged from the fact that there was all this wild variation in expression. And this is the reason, I think, why people tend not, by why it's so unusual for a post-war car to win uh, best of show at pebble because at that point you get mass-produced cars they all look the same there's no sort of like expression in the car that varies from car to car there they stop becoming individual items and are sort of mass-produced produced. objects which is why i think most newer cars, one of the reasons why most newer car shows are clean car contests Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, you go right. to something like uh, Legends of the Autobahn at Monterey Car Week, which mm-hmm. is just a sea of Mercedes, um, BMW. BMWs and Audis. And, you know, the question just is who cleaned the grit out of the tire tread of their car better than the other? Because at the end of the day, all of the cars should be identical. Mm-hmm. Right. So you could talk about a spec. Oh, this one's green with green interior. 
yay, that's a very different thing than this is a completely different body that shares nothing yes. other than kind of And it is the only one built and it has this right. crazy story because the guy was a little bit unhinged to do something this right. outrageous and that's why we are valuing it now. There was a car while I was on. So one of the things I did while we were there was live auction commentary, which I've never done before. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, you know, we, I wasn't concerned with the prices or whatever. It was, it was me, Ramsey Potts, who's an auction specialist and Larry Webster, who we've had on the podcast uh, yeah, um, at Broad Arrow, at Broad Arrow, uh, that Ramsey is at Broad Arrow. Yeah. Well, all under the Haggerty, uh, uh, umbrella. So we were there talking about cars and there was one, um, Mercedes, I think it was a 540 K that uh, had it was the widest one ever made. And this was an interesting story. It was, I, it was a European owner. I believe he was Swedish. I don't remember. But he was a silver Olympian. I do, this all happened so fast. that So I apologize for this. Also on zero sleep. Um, but he was like, does this look in it like a 540K to you? And I'm like, eh, it was a little bit different. So when we sort of came on, he told me the story, which was that it was purchased by a guy who was an, a former Olympian. And he had some other crazy thing that he had accomplished but actually was a spy (laughs) and so and the way they accomplished him sort of fitting into society and no one noticing that he was a spy was that he lived the most lavish sort of playboy lifestyle imaginable Mm -hmm. and he had the car what a tough gig no shit he had the car widened so that he could fit two women next to him in the front (laughs) so they were three wide all the time that's the kind of shit you don't get right at legends of the autobahn right and that's what makes those car stories. shows so yeah. interesting. The story so yeah, and when you go through Pebble Beach, probably seventy percent of the cars have some obscene story like yeah. that. But you can't consume it when you're just walking by the car, right. especially when there's two hundred and fifty of yeah. them. Uh, and that's the really just wild, unhinged stuff that mm-hmm. makes those cars special, even if they're not sort of directly relevant to the person. Mm-hmm. It, and it's it's a type of car, and this is something I commonly feel about vintage cars, which is if you told the story of this car or to any person who had any interest in cars or even no interest in cars, they'd be like, holy shit, that's freaking cool. But you can't consume that by walking by it Correct. when it's parked on the lawn. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it, I don't know how to bridge that, but they are intrinsically really interesting mm-hmm. and every one of them has some kind of wild story pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so Yes, all of this to say that uh, those types of cars were certainly present, uh, oh, yeah. but also the stuff that excites people without any initiation because it's a space that's more familiar to them. Whether you know whether that's in the form of Skyline GTRs, or there was a roof yellow bird, which was mm-hmm. not yellow, uh, or you were very upset about the chrome window trim on that. Yeah, I mean, I was. It was disappointing. I, I, I think I don't. I mean, it doesn't look right to me. Disappointing. Well, it's just a. It's a. It's anachronistic. It would be like. I don't know, when you put LED headlights on an old car or, you know, where they're obviously modern headlights and you put like wheels that are very obviously modern, to me it was just discordant. But, you know. And the wrong headlights on it. Yes, it had headlights from the 1960s on the car, even though it was from the 1980s. I mean, whatever. Yeah, it's funny. Um, Yeah, that's the the drawback of knowing too much. Um, Okay, so Radwood. Mm -hmm. So we initially had a pretty poor... um, our impression of Radwood because we walked in at seven o'clock and when everyone started to drive in and we're like, wow, this is small and there's not a lot of stuff here. Well, I knew that the, everyone was still parking. Well, I mean, I, you, the, this was the problem was that someone- We had to go in at zero dark 30 before any of the cars were there so that we could go over and across the street and comment on, yeah. on them while the other while they were still parking. Right, because someone decided we were doing an offsite uh, podcast by ourselves across the street with no one around before the fucking cars drove in. So we're just going to keep hammering this home so you guys know- the, uh, so that any management at Haggerty who might be consuming <laughs> this episode no, it's, might consider some other listen, schedule think, in the future. I don't think our, that last episode was up to par for us. Yeah. I just, we just didn't, we were there to cover an event that hadn't happened yet. And I think we kind of owe our audience an apology. Like, okay, we talked about some Audi stuff. It was cool. We got some, a point of view from a Chrysler exec. That was cool, but it just wasn't our normal thing because that which we were there to discuss hadn't yet happened. No, no, no. Um, but uh, but when we came back from, so we walked around, did our thing, and then went back to Radwood. Holy shit, Florida. Florida turned it out. Yeah. There were some great cars. Mm-hmm. Really Interesting great cultural cars. differences also, I would say, from West Coast Radwood. You could actually see pr- regional preferences being expressed, mm-hmm. which I thought was neat. 
a lot more American stuff, you mean? Yeah, there was that whole Buick display, which was, was very awesome. impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, the Callaway pair, which was kind of neat. I was also surprised to see there's, and this might- This is Callaway ZR1. Uh, yeah, You're Callaway Corvette right. C4s, mm-hmm. right. uh, which, you know, they made the twin turbo cars, which were famously like insanely fast mm-hmm. in period. They were like 200 plus mile an hour cars at the time. Uh And I noticed a lot of sort of thematic enthusiasm for Mercedes-Benz, and Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's like an emerging trend in the industry now, because I have long been passionate about those cars, and it was interesting to see both in the auction front and outside of the auction sphere, seeing, and then of course the Patina Collective had this wild collection of 80s tuner cars, you know, Gullwing S-Class Coupes, and there was a V12 swapped S-Class Coupe from the 80s, a a silver C126 with an M120 V12 in it, uh, you know, there was a Picasso interior R129, and all these like wild tuner cars and that's mm-hmm. kind of their specialty is to collect and they you know brought i don't know what it was 10 or at least of those cars out and displayed yeah. them all in a pile and that wasn't um, that wasn't at radwood let's that's that was across correct. the street but, back at that cars and caffeine yes correct but but the, generally speaking there was a lot of interesting mercedes stuff happening during that weekend which yeah. was not a space that i'm used to seeing you know aside from goings and pre-war stuff of right. course like the 540k to see those cars getting mainstream collector acknowledgement was kind of weird. Well, it's pretty cool. I yeah. mean, if I had to, if I would say like the last brand of a car that I would ever take to Car Week, mm-hmm. other than, you know, like a Kia, um, w- enthusiast car, nothing against Kia, um, would be a Porsche, right? The joke that I made one time that I that I got myself in a little trouble doing Legends of the Autobahn, I said, everyone look around. I want everyone to look to the left, I want you to look to the right and re- realize there's no fucking 911s because the 911 is the Pebble Beach Pinto. Everyone is driving a 911 or mm-hmm. a car week. I would say that if you I- You got would, in trouble for that? No, I got it. Well, Mercedes Car Club was upset because I used the F-bomb. Uh, but BMW <laughs> asked me back the next year. <laughs> and BMW runs the event. Um, but it was because of, no fucking 911s. Um, seriously, and there were, I, was a cheer as a result oh, of yeah, that also. Oh, yeah, huge cheer, yeah. And it was a joke. It was lighthearted. There was actually a, a boxster. There was one soul... Uh, Porsche and it was water cooled and I went over to the guy and I gave him some sort of award. I don't remember what, what did. I shook his hand. It was funny, right? Everyone was joking. I'm like, you know, there's the Audi section, which I constantly refer to as the understeer section. Like if you're there as one of those guys who are on the microphone the whole time, you can choose to play it totally straight and just, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're here, blah, 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 or have make everyone laugh. And if the guy in the background is just babbling for hours, no one's listening. So I just kept my mouth shut for most of the time and then would open my mouth when I had something funny to say or something interesting to point out or, hey, come and check out this car because it's cool um but i would not drive a mercedes-benz to amelia because it was like the official car of everything Mm -hmm. so not only were probably half let it be let it be known also that mercedes to my knowledge did not have any oem presence there did they i saw nothing and no one yeah good point (laughs) i mean lucid was there yeah obviously chrysler was there for that one thing rivian was there yeah um, uh, there was a big BMW display right when you first walked mm-hmm. in also. BMW was there. Audi had two cars there. Um, Motorsport, Motorsport. Historical cars. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, nothing new. But yeah, no, I, I would say half of the cars at that Cars and Caffeine were, were Mercedes. The Mercedes section probably comprised almost half mm-hmm. of the whole show. And in the sort of overflow catch-all section, probably about a quarter of them were Mercedes Benzes. And then at Radwood, the Mercedes presence was off the charts. And it wasn't just, oh, here's another 300 SD, right? Yeah. Not Nothing against the 300 SD, but it was crazy motor swaps. Yeah. Crazy. There was some 140s. There were three 140s, V12s. Four, four if you four, include the coupe. coupe yes. Yeah, right next to it, like, okay, what are these all doing here? Yeah. Um, and then there was that convertible 190 over at Cars and Caffeine. They were just Mercedes everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was weird because normally I feel like an, a sort of random aside uh, when I'm in a Mercedes or expressing yeah. Mercedes enthusiasm. And so to see that getting mainstream was interesting. But maybe, well, is, I don't know if that's a regional difference or the result of a, a, a small group of very committed people or... Well, you know what, I, I think I said at the time to, to you, remember that there are no curves on any roads. Sure, within so Mercedes a, a, is a great car for the Floridian landscape. You were enthusiast in, for example, South Florida, Central Florida, where there's no, where the roads are only straight. You want something that works. Do you want a 911 with shitty air conditioning? Mm. right i mean it just doesn't nothing wrong with 911s you know that i love them but there's i mean there's nothing was made yeah, like the, all of the best attributes of a 911 cannot be expressed correct in florida unless you're on the track at daytona yeah. or sebring yeah. yeah and so you know all my car car guy friends and car guy friends in mercedes in land. florida mercedes land i.e florida yes uh drive yeah. a florida drive a florida yeah, okay <laughs> uh not a lancia 
The Floridia? Was oh, there? yes. The concept before the uh, Flaminia sedan was yeah. the launch of Florida 1 and 2. Yeah. That's true. See? We we did the episode once once upon a time where we named cars that were named after places and that stuff mm-hmm. where I learned there was a launch Lancia of Florida. Florida. Yes. Um, it's gorgeous. Um, yeah. There was a, there were a ton of Mercedes Benz, um, but mm-hmm. really, really good stuff. Yeah. Um, there was not as much. And some expensive stuff too. You know, there was that, that ha- not hammer wagon because it's a two cam that sold for $467,000. This is at the auctions now. At the auctions. Because yes. by the way, so it, literally every event was overrun by Mercedes yes. from auction to Radwood to cars and caffeine, except for the only one that was overrun with Porsches was the hangar. It was overrun yes. with Porsches rather than Mercedes. Well, there was an all Porsche event the day before, apparently, which we did not attend. Thank God. Um, <laughs> but some interesting auction results, big money. And this includes Miami also. So there's also some backstory here. This used to be one event. It got sort of, sort of bifurcated when um, RM, which was the big auction. There's three big auction houses now. There's RM. There's good, prestigious ones. I guess there's four if you include the slightly less prestigious one, which is, is Bottoms. Uh, and then there's RM. There's Broad Arrow. And there's Gooding. And um, RM and Gooding were the really prestigious ones. And then there was a sort of palace revolt and a bunch of talented people left and started Broad Arrow, which then got a big infusion of capital from Haggerty. And obviously RM was cross about this. And so they keep trying to one up Broad Arrow's presence. And so they moved to Miami and did an auction at exactly the same time in Miami, which is a five and a half hour drive away uh, as a sort of like middle finger uh, to the people who defected. And uh, so this, is, so the results that I'm talking about include the Miami results, even though we weren't in Miami. Let me ask a question. Who really gets the middle finger? Is it sellers that get the middle finger? Because why would you do two major events five and a half hours apart, just far enough that you can't go back and forth between the two of them? Um, but I just, mean, yeah, it's an ego thing. It's not serving uh, the public. Yeah, well, it's not. I don't think it's serving the sellers of those cars. Yes. If who's no one's going to choose to go to Miami over Amelia? I think some people did. I mean, well, I, obviously, for, someone was there. Only people who specifically wanted a car that was in that auction. Yes, right? yes. Everyone Industry else professionals went, who are sort of transacting. I mean, yeah. I think there was an event there. It looked actually pretty legit, but you know, okay. I don't know. So there, there's an effort to sort of. There's some jostling. There's behind the scenes drama there that is happening as a result of Miami. But in, in any case, there were some really expensive Mercedes that sold. There was this non-hammer two cam AMG built wagon that sold for four hundred and sixty-seven thousand uh, dollars. And then there was an SL seventy three R one twenty nine that sold for. Did you hear about this? No. Six hundred and ten thousand yeah. dollars for an r129 but they only made what like 19 of those or something yeah really? it's incredibly rare it's wow. just the top of the heap but still i mean it's a 90s mercedes yeah. that sold for six hundred thousand cool. dollars and it looks like something that you would buy on craigslist for eighty five hundred dollars yeah. mm-hmm. and throw some amg wheels on mm-hmm. you know so uh That's yeah cool. and then of course some evo 190s which are sort of spicy in the market right now 190s generally of all types seem to be having a moment in the market maybe we part, might have contributed to that <laughs> through our Discussion. Our, our, our Go ahead. I've owned, I've owned one nineties for twenty years, so I, you know, yeah. I can't. I can't be responsible for the fact that they're taking off now. It's it's your fault. Okay, um. I will accept the blame. I guess. <laughs> so it was interesting to see. You know, again, this is something very common in the market is demographic shift and changing the, of people's interests. But you know, all of the things that we extol the virtues about those cars are in fact true, and people are becoming aware of it. And Sorry, but also you're welcome for enjoying a new frontier of automotive enjoyment that you might not have considered in the past if you learned about it through us. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, other comments, topics to, to cover? Um, well, the, I, the one question, if we're going to talk about auctions, is what is what is what were the results like? Like, is this the end of the world for car collectors? No. For And who cares if it is? Because they all have so much money. Um, okay. Fair point. So no, I was just saying, I just don't want... There were some the, interesting trends for sure. Uh, you know, underlining this changing of the guard theme, there was definitely some former blue chip stuff that sort of fell on his face. Like it was shocking to see a pair of Series 1 Jaguar E-type coupes sell both in the 50s with the premium. I mean, that is just an obscene number. One of them looked quite rough. The other looked pleasant enough. I didn't see and either in person. would they have been? I mean, those could have the rougher one could have been like an eighty or ninety thousand dollar car, and the really nice one, having not seen it in person other than in photos and flipped through them for eighteen seconds, uh, that could have been a hundred and forty, hundred and fifty thousand dollar car, maybe you know, five years ago. 
Wow, that's uh, a huge drop. Yeah, but I also quickly. didn't look at it closely. I right. mean, it appeared to be matching numbers. It had interesting colors. It In the photos on my phone, it didn't look like it was actively decomposing. But, you know, maybe if I looked at it up close, I would have been like, wow, that's an obvious rust repair and there's mm -hmm. lots of Bondo under it. I don't know. I, don't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it. In any case, just wild to see a public sale result for one of those cars in the 50s. Uh, then, you know, other stuff that I talked about, the sort of more modern stuff, selling strongly. Uh, and then, you know, like really unrepeatable, high quality, expensive stuff selling well, like, uh, you know, vintage V12 Ferraris are definitely soft in the market right now. But then a couple of Daytona Spiders sold really strongly, uh, both in unusual colors. And that's a very rare, always desirable car. Whereas sort of more middling non-Spider Daytona sold, didn't sell, didn't make reserve. Uh, and so the, the places, you know, Ferraris used to be of that era used to be untouchable in the collector market. And there were, there's definitely like, it's a buyer's market. And if it's a junk car, you know, people may probably won't mm -hmm. buy it. Um, so it was, it was variable, you know, it, I, to me, it's a sign of a healthy market because, you can be discerning if it's a junk car, it's not going to sell for some what the fuck number, you know, it's actually going to the, the market is going to say, well, that's not a very good car. So it doesn't get the money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a healthy market where if you want to get good money, it has to be good. I mean, there are, of course, exceptions, but it, to me, it's, you know, not superheated like it was two years ago. And it's not like the sky is falling either. And it's good. very variable based on what the car is. So it's good. And listen, when I asked it, you know, it's not because I'm worried that and, uh, you know, some billionaire is going to lose some money, 50 cents to them, which would be you know, hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. dollars or millions on their car. It's only because the sort of general thinking is that what happens in the blue chip collector market then trickles down ultimately. And so the stuff that we like and we can afford and we could drive would also be tanking if the rest of the market is tanking. Yeah. Um, it, it's I just not, don't see that. No, I don't see it tanking. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, really extraordinary stuff does get extraordinary results. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's sort of middle of the road, then you could get lucky and have that happen. But uh, it's certainly not guaranteed. And there's opportunity out there. Mm -hmm. It's not a time to be discouraged if you're interested in buying something, no matter what the price point is. Okay. What was your favorite car of the weekend? <sighs> I don't know. Do you have an answer to that question? No, of course not. I mean, I was asked to give that award at Radwood and I... I, I it wasn't really fair to everyone because I had to run through there like the place was on fire because I had mm -hmm. to go back to give, giving commentary. And my two finalists were the were this I call the award ith if an award um and it's i d d h i drive that home um mm -hmm. and that's just that's frankly a, a cheap way for me to get out of having to like you know inspect panel gaps and paint thickness on a car i don't really care about that let's just make it about what's the car that just i drove i, I wanted to drive home the car that that I gave the award to was an E39 5. Uh, it was probably built on a 528 or 530. 530 it had right. a 3.2 liter. liter Alpina manual um, E39 wagon. Mm -hmm. It was just beautiful. Yeah. And that just... And just right in terms of how it was done. Exactly. Just exactly the, the, the best E39 wagon I could have imagined. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have a soft spot for that car. I had two E39s, one wagon back in the day. And I love that. It was an easy choice because I know that car well enough mm -hmm. to know what came in second probably should have come in first. Um, and it was an Evo Mitsubishi Evo mm -hmm. um, that I just thought like that would be one hell of a car to drive home in across country. Right. This is, yeah. you know, that I'm thinking about this is a two, three thousand avoiding drive. highways the entire time. Well, but that would be fun. I mean, that would be a hell of an experience driving an Evo across country. Like that's yeah. the one that I probably should have picked. The E39 was like, that was comfortable, but I'm, I don't think I'll ever be that old and, you know, and high maintenance. Like I need comfort, long cruising distances and comfort. No, give me something high revving, screaming, mi miserable, boosty. boosty that I have to get gas every 200 miles. I don't think those cars made it 200 miles. Um, that would have been a hell of a drive home, but I just didn't know enough about the car and I didn't have enough uh, time enough. So I mentioned it in the sort of a reward ceremony, but that's the one that I should have given. And then you told me about a V12 manual swap. Yeah. To, which well, was a C C126, right, which C126. I mentioned before. So this was a, a manual, like I've never driven a manual Mercedes uh, V12. They, they never obviously made any. Um, Right? It'd have to be a Pagani. Pagani. <laughs> but I mean, could you imagine like if that had equal length headers like those yeah. like those YouTube videos? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean it's basically a Mercedes eight fifty CSI at that CSI point. CSI yeah. or CI, um, yeah. Yeah, that I, that would have been one like a one twenty six coupe is a badass car and they're mm -hmm. they're 
they're you know I love the huge steering wheels. There are some wonderful yeah, things about that. Pillarlessness car. is really beautiful as well. Yeah, so that car is definitely honorable mention. I really liked, as I mentioned in the last episode, seeing the uh, IMSA GTO class mm-hmm. Audi 90 in person because I love the story and I've never seen one of those in person. I would have loved to hear it. Uh, because those cars are some of the coolest sounding cars of all time, so that car definitely got honorable mention for me. Uh, there was a you know pretty healthy Ferrari um, V12 contingent at Amelia. There was a competition class, which of course was won by GTO, and there was a bunch of TDFs there. Uh, and then there was a street car class, with that, which I think was dedicated exclusively to 250s. There was an absolutely gorgeous Series One PF Cabriolet uh, in Burgundy, and that is a sort of like. If you're not initiated, it looks like every other open V12 Ferrari from the 1950s and 60s. But I, the Series One to me is just so like achingly pretty and elegant. You know, everyone focuses on California, and those are worth more. But I think PF1 cab is Series One cab is just like one of the coolest. Uh, so I really enjoyed seeing that. It's really cool to see a roof yellow bird, mm-hmm. um, despite the chrome trim. Uh, yeah. I don't know what else I did I really I enjoy. This. We got a great story about an F50 as well, which yeah. hopefully you will tell in more detail at some point in the future. At some point. There were a bunch of F50s. That black F50. It, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh Very my. rare. Three three black F50s were made. Right. And so, there was a, a black Enzo next to a black F50. In yeah. Slot. And then next to two red F50s. So that was. And the red F50. I mean, it's, it's sure. Fine. Sure. But I haven't driven. I've still not driven one. Yeah. You, um, you should at some I point. I don't need to. Why well, ruin my life? Well. <laughs> I actually have a client right now who wants to potentially sell his because he thinks it's not as exciting as uh, F40s, which he has owned in the past. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah. But you've fun- driven both. I've driven both. I yeah. found the F50 to be exciting. Right? It's, it's not unhinged, um, but it is exciting and it, it feels special. And the presence of the engine in the car is really special and it's naturally aspirated V12 and you know manual transmission. And it you know is an F1 derived engine. I think it's cool. He's maybe just extra unhinged, I, uh, I d- but the F40 also is just so insane because of the boostiness of it that, you know, maybe the nat, you really got to wind that 50 out to get mm-hmm. to the power. It's like a, you know, traditional naturally aspirated RPM dependent power delivery. How, peaky but how does it compare experience and noise wise to an Enzo? Um, I prefer it because it's a manual and I like looking right. at it better. Same, but I'm just talking about sound. The reason why, the only one of those cars that I've driven is a Maserati MC12, which is an Enzo, mm-hmm. right? And I I was very disappointed in the engine note. Mm. I mean, it's an automated manual, so you don't get to interact with the with the throttle to see how light and responsive, the, the, you know, the, how light the flywheel is and the, mm-hmm. how responsive it is. It was good, but it just didn't. The, the problem with all of these early V12s is that early... <laughs> Okay, there are three chapters in the in the history of V12. There's the carbureted chapter where every one of them sounds fucking unbelievable and that is what made the world say V12 is the best engine layout, right? No question. Here, here are 250 Testarossa or GTO at full song or listen to your Mura, which sounds nothing like that, but mm-hmm. is equally as like mind-bendingly complicated and complex. Um, once they all got fuel injection, I will say that I don't think there is a single V12 in that era that sounds anywhere near as good as most straight sixes. Yeah, I'm trying to think about the great, the best sort of yeah fuel injected V12 from the first two decades of fuel injected V12s. It didn't. They didn't get great, and this might be a slightly people might get upset about this. I don't think they got great until two cars. Diablo, Diablo is pretty uh, good. It's pretty good. It didn't get great until Aventador and 599 GTO. And the reason GTO was regular 599 had a 621. It's really dependent on the exhaust setup. Right. But 599 went 6 to 1 uh, GTO. And that then became the um, the exhaust layout of choice for 812 and all the other Ferraris going forward. Total night and day. That's when you get the. <laughs> yeah, the, the 550 doesn't Yeah, definitely sound good. I definitely agree with that. There's a few exceptions, but I hear what you're saying. They definitely have nowhere near as much character as uh, the, the carbureted ones or, or the really latest stuff. Yeah. Right. Huayra sounded amazing. 
Uh, Zonda, excuse me. Yes. Zonda sounds like Wire doesn't. Well, Wire sounds pretty good. But it's, you know. It's turbocharged. They sort of figured it out. They really figured it out in the last 15 years. Prior to that, it's always a disappointment. Anyone drives an E31 8 Series or any Mercedes V12. or Well, Apple, that's like, not the mission of those cars. The, the F50 in the car, because it's bolted to the chassis, mm-hmm. and, you know, famously, Jeremy Clarkson said it's bolted to your spine. Uh, it is definitely present in a way that not a lot of fuel-injected mm-hmm. V12s are. And it's a high revving engine right. that delivers delivers the power near the peak, near the red line, mm-hmm. and uh, not a ton of torque. And it's an engine that takes you on a journey where you really have to wind it out to go anywhere. And if you, you know, don't do that, you miss some of the magic. Hmm. Yeah, I was I, I, MC12 was amazing. I E Enzo, amazing, but that engine doesn't compare to. It was one of the best of that sort of middle section, mm-hmm. but it doesn't compare to the carved cars or the six into one mm-hmm. uh, cars that are just different, different league. I mean, the Aventador is a car I'm not a particular fan of, but oh my God, that engine, that has to be the best sounding V12 of all time. Um, it's just nuts. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, Okay, what else? Amelia, Florida, we had no interaction with Floridians. <laughs> we didn't we didn't jake did he was accosted by a florida man for 45 <laughs> minutes during a rainstorm when he couldn't leave the place where he was because it was raining so this hard. is what jake gets for going for a walk on the beach when there's a car show going on thinking he's going to escape uh <laughs> escape all bad luck yeah. all bad things um okay so this was a, a fun amelia was this was your first amelia this was my first one yes <gasps> Derek's cherries popped you, yeah um, okay, maybe uh, maybe we'll try. Uh, there's another show coming up, isn't there? We have some discussion about the Greenwich Concours at the end of May, mm-hmm. uh, and attending there. that. I've never been either. Yeah, uh, but I guess uh, Haggerty's interested in having us visit it, so I would Be love fun. to see that. Because we've both obviously been to Pebble to Villa Desta, mm-hmm. and we can we'll sort of start coming up with the ultimate guide to which car shows to go to and which to avoid at all costs. Yeah, I mean, if you're local or, and or in the trade and wanting to see cars transact, it's a good place to go. I mean, it, you I use the reference point of where the auction companies bother to show up and have sales mm-hmm. uh, because I'm in the industry. Maybe if I weren't, I wouldn't use the same standard, uh, but it certainly attracts some attention and. And, and Amelia Island, Scottsdale, and uh, Car Week are the big American events auctions. where the where there are auctions. But there are no, there are no show at Scottsdale, right? It's no, just an auction. No, it's mostly cars transacting. That's true. I think there has to be probably mm-hmm. some kind of Scottsdale Concours or something, but I certainly don't know anything about it. I, it must I mean, exist. an old car in Scottsdale is probably a 2010. I mean, <laughs> it's not exactly a historical city, is it? Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Uh, join us next week we for the f- yes we will have additional content thank you for joining us for this discussion more complete discussion of Amelia Island so we could do the topic some justice uh, and uh, we'll we'll see you or, or you'll see us or not see us you'll listen to listen us, us or not <laughs> yeah or not uh, next week okay we're done yes <laughs>